and a Civic Type R GT UK 2017 review. Broader batted, more mature Honda Civic Type R works well on UK roads, but still doesn't offer the fun factor of rivals. What is it? The Honda Civic Type R, in this its glowering, jutting and angrily blistered fifth generation form, has a landed. Faster, stronger, more powerful and more advanced than any of its forebears, the British-built hot Honda Civic has now begun rolling off its Swindon production line in serious numbers. But has its big moment finally come? This is the first Type R in more than a decade to move back to all independent suspension, the first to be developed as a performance machine from the ground up rather than adapted from an existing platform. This Type R broke the lap record for a front-wheel drive production vehicle at the Nord's Life earlier this year. And this is the first review you'll read anywhere on an absolutely final, series production specification, right-hand drive example. Like all Type R's to date, the fifth-generation Civic is front-wheel drive and sticks with a traditional six-speed manual gearbox for what Honda considers the purest, simplest and potentially most dynamically compelling hot hatch driving experience possible. Compared with the fourth-generation model introduced only two years ago, it has a stiffer and lighter body and entirely new suspension and steering systems. A relatively understated powertrain overhaul makes for a 10 bhp power boost, while torque remains unchanged. If you like your performance statistics, you may not be instantly impressed with this car, despite the 10 bhp power gain and a final drive ratio shorted by 7%, the new Type R only manages to match the car it replaces on 0 to 62 miles per hour standing start acceleration at 5.7 seconds, and beats it on top speed by a 2 miles per hour margin. But don't be fooled, Honda's claim is that the superiority of the new version runs deep, and we've already confirmed some of its strides in our European first drive. What's it like? Like all of Honda's current gen Civics, the Type R is a big car feeling a size larger on the road than most of its immediate rivals and suffering a bit on narrow or British B roads as a result. The car's new platform does allow for an improvement on its infamously perched old driving position, but you still don't sit as low in it as some would like and there isn't a huge amount of telescopic steering column adjustment for longer-legged drivers. The car's power steering, clutch, gear lever and brake pedal all feel very carefully honed well-weighted, progressive and positive. But there's a softness to throttle response that's at odds with the encouraging precision and tactility of the rest of the controls, not to mention the Type R's long-standing reputation for hair-trigger sensitivity. Plenty of more powerful four-cylinder hot hatchbacks have less turbo lag, but then, very few offer Honda's naturally high revving, fractionally over-square cylinder design. And the truth is, the Honda's turbo lag is a problem that only threatens to spoil your enjoyment for so long. Once you learn to compensate for the engine's penchant for a dramatic pause, you'll find it has greater overall range than most four-cylinder turbos and also a more compelling power delivery than most. Floor it and the engine kicks hard at about 3,500 revolutions per minute, then harder still at about 5,000 revolutions per minute before revving cleanly and with only a gradually ebbing keenness all the way to 7,000 revolutions per minute. And it sounds like an engine, not like a whistling, fizzing jamber eon fireworks night and not like a video game. Sure, the car is generously fast, but, more importantly, it's characterful and genuine. Ride and handling both seem like worthwhile improvements over what came before but on neither front does the Civic quite threaten to unseat the hot hatchback ruling powers. The car's 20 in alloys and low-profile tires make for a noisy motorway ride, but a much more supple one than the old Type R had. Off the motorway, bump compliance is good with the adaptive dampers set to comfort, with a hint of woodenness evident as you ramp up firmness. Overall, though, the chassis feels taut precise and decently absorptive in sport mode, it breathes better and better with the road as you pile on speed. Through bends, 
the Civic has a very great set of Continental Performance tires, good handling response, excellent body control for a big car, a slippy diff willing to make its presence felt and a rear axle that becomes gently mobile on a trailing throttle without ever threatening big angles. It all makes for a rewarding car to drive hard, drive hard. ever since 2003 has been doing a pretty good job being in the middle between compact and mid-size SUVs. For 2016, it completely redesigned Sorento carries on with this formula, but it's now more refined and a little bigger this time around than the previous generation. So let's go ahead and check out this 2016 Kia Sorento SX. Now as far as styling goes on this new Sorento, I think it's quite evolutionary this time around. Of course you still have Kia's Tiger Nose corporate front grille and you can easily tell it's a Kia by that front grille right there. And then on this SX trim you have these red painted calipers that you also had on the last generation Sorento. But this time around it's also a little bit more masculine, a little bit more muscular and beefed up and more aggressive and in your face with this new headlight design. But overall I think it's a quite handsome looking vehicle. Now since we do have the SX trim here, it does come pretty loaded. We have a panoramic sunroof on the Sorento, a full on leather interior, navigation system, as well as LED accenting lights. Now here goes the key fob for the vehicle. As you can see it's a fairly high quality looking key fob design. You have your lock unlock to release your tailgate, you do have a power tailgate, and then your panic button too of course. Now it is a white exterior color with smart key access on the driver's door and front passenger door. You also do have chrome exterior door handles. Power driver seat with power recline and power lumbar and you also do have a power adjustable thigh extension. It has a full on two toned light gray and dark gray leather interior. Now stepping on inside of the new Sorento, as you can see, it's a fairly high quality looking cabin. And where they really improved on in the interior the most over the previous generation was build quality and materials. It's a lot better in this generation Sorento than the last one. But pretty stylish looking cabin design. They do have push button ignition of course, just put your foot on the brake and hit the button to start. And what you're hearing is a 3.3 liter V6, leather wrapped steering wheel, love the steering wheel rim, has a decent grip to it. Now coming to your transmission in typical Kia fashion, you have a 6 speed automatic, nowadays that's pretty normal stuff, however I would love to see more gears for improved fuel economy, but you do have manual shiftability. And then putting the vehicle into reverse displays your rear view camera with guidance lines and you also do have trajectory as well as rear cross traffic alert. And I'm going to go ahead and turn on the lights and the hazards too. All windows are fully automatic and let's go ahead and pop up the hood and check out the engine bay. Heated exterior mirrors with LED turn signal indicators and you also do have blind spot detection. You also do have 19 inch alloy wheels. Halogen projector beam headlights with LED accenting lights and you also do have your halogen fog lights. Like I said it's a more aggressive and beefed up 
appearance this time around, much more muscular. Now under the hood here, like I said, you will find the optional 3.3 liter V6 producing 290 horses at 6400 RPM and 252 pound-feet of torque at 5300 RPM with the EPA estimates with the all-wheel drive system being a reasonable 17 in the city and 23 on the highway running on regular unleaded fuel. Now your base powertrain on the Sorento is going to be a 2.4 liter four-cylinder and then if you do get the five passenger Sorento you can get the two liter four-cylinder turbo and that's a new powertrain for the 2016 model year. But oh, we'll see what this baby could do when we hit the road later in the video. Now, if you do get the five passenger version of the Sorento, competitors include the Nissan Rogue, Chevrolet Equinox, as well as the Honda CRV. Now, if you get the seven passenger version, like how we have here, competitors include the Toyota Highlander, Honda Pilot, Ford Explorer, as well as the Chevrolet Traverse. Now pricing of the Sorento starts at the base trim, which is the L model, and that starts at $24,900, and it comes pretty well equipped with LED accenting lights, Bluetooth phone connectivity, as well as driver mode select. Then you step up to the LX trim, which starts at $26,200. Then you have the EX, which starts at $31,100. The SX, like how we have here, starts at $37,900. And then finally, the SX Limited starts at $39,900. Coming to the rear, you have LED tail lights, rear reflectors, a rear window wiper with a rear window defroster, and rear parking sensors too. And like I said, you do have rear cross traffic alert. Very stylish. Now like I said, EPA estimates are 17 in the city, 23 on the highway, Total vehicle price for this particular one is $40,895. Of course you have all of your basic power necessities, power windows, door locks, power mirrors. You also do have power folding exterior mirrors too. Memory seat settings for two people. Nice soft touch padded armrest. And let's go ahead and rev it up. Now there is a decent sense of pretty good sophistication in the 2016 Kia Sorento's ride that its predecessors lacked, as even the top of the line models with their big 19 inch wheels managed to soak up road bumps pretty good. Kia's midsize crossover is also pretty darn quiet, especially in the EX trim and above. So count the 2016 Sorento as a very comfortable family hauler. Now every 2016 Sorento comes with the driver mode select which features three modes, normal, sport, and eco that alter transmission shift points and steering effort. Although I could detect the changes in the former, it was difficult to kind of differentiate between the steering settings, at least in our SX test vehicle. It's important to note though that the SX and SX Limited actually have a different steering system that should yield a greater sense of precision and feel than the other trims. Now with this 3.3 liter V6 engine, it definitely has enough power on tap here for your daily commute. 
with 290 horses. Now, Kia expects most people to buy the new Sorento with the base four-cylinder engine. And to be honest, I recommend avoiding that powertrain as it doesn't really have enough power to motivate this crossover here. Now, if you can live without seven seats, I recommend going with the turbocharged four-cylinder engine as I found the power delivery to be a little bit better than the V6 engine. Now overall, I like the steering on the Sorento, and I think it provides a decent balance between ride comfort and pretty good steering, but remember that this is no sports car here, but it's much better than the previous generation Sorento. I could really feel for where the SUV is trying to go. Very nice. Now as far as build quality and materials go inside of the Sorento here, it's much better than the previous generation in build quality. You won't find that many panel gaps inside of here compared to the last generation. And same goes with the materials. Materials is much better than the previous generation. You have a nice soft touch upper door panel. Down here on the armrest it's also a nice soft touch. It's decently padded on the mid door panel. And then up here, it's also a nice soft touch material with nice premium stitching. Also nice and padded right here. And then where your uh, knees might hit, it's also nice and soft touch right here. I was pretty surprised about that. But overall, build quality and materials is pretty good inside of the Sorento. Now, I wasn't really a big fan of the last generation in terms of its steering wheel design. And... This is a much better steering wheel here. It's much more modern looking and I love the controls on them too. And then I love the grip the steering wheel has as well. Now coming to the controls, of course you have all of your basic controls like your Bluetooth phone controls, voice recognition, and your steering wheel mounted audio controls. And then coming over here you have your cruise control buttons and then this button right here controls your TFT instrument cluster which I'll get to a little later in the video. But overall, it's a very nice looking steering wheel. You also do have a manually tilting and telescoping steering wheel. Decent range of adjustment. Now coming down here, you have your auxiliary input, your USB port, and two 12 volt power outlets. And you also do have a little storage cubby down there. And then right here, you will find your cup holders. And then your lockable center differential, your parking sensors off button, and then your different driver selectable modes. And then coming to the center console, it's nice and padded and stitched, very high quality. Then you also do have another USB port down there. And then the center console storage is okay. Coming up here, you have your auto dimming rear view mirror with garage home link. Your sunglass container, very high quality, fine with felt too. And then you have your interior illumination lighting, LEDs. And then your panoramic sunroof. Gives the cabin a much more open, airy feel. And you also do have your sliding shade. Pretty nice. This is also LED too. A lot of manufacturers just make this LED and then just make this normal light. But that's also LED as well. Headliner is also pretty high quality, nice and plush. You have this fabric headliner, it's really nice. Now coming to the main center stack controls, I love how utilitarian it looks, but it's also pretty stylish and high quality looking at the same time and it's pretty simple and easy to use as well really big knobs and buttons here you have dual zone automatic climate control your temperatures are right here and then you have your front window defroster rear window defroster your different zones and it'll display up on the touchscreen display and then you have your fan speeds and then when you click on climate right here it goes to your climate control on the touchscreen display. Then you have your recycling mode too. 
pretty easy to figure out. And then down here you have your heated seats. Now coming over here, you have your gauge brightness, and then you have your blind spot detection, and then the orange light will illuminate if you turned it on. And then you have your 115 volt power outlet if you want to turn that on, and then your traction control off button. Now coming to the main head unit, you have Kia's UVO system with the 8 inch touchscreen display. Coming to your radio, you have your AM, FM, Sirius XM satellite radio, HD radio on this bad boy too. Coming to your media, your different media sources include Bluetooth, streaming audio, your USB, and then your auxiliary input too. And then coming to UVO, you have your UVO e-services, you have roadside assistance, your points of interest, your e-services guide, my car zone, parking minder, and your vehicle diagnostics. And then when you want to access the navigation system, you actually do have to have an SD card and slotted right there. And then coming to your phone, of course, you have an integrated dial pad. You can hook up your phone on here, have all your contacts, of course, all that good stuff. And then coming to info, you can access Pandora Internet Radio, SoundHound, and then you have apps that you could download. A quick guide, voice commands, series XM data, and then your climate. And then coming to setup, you can change many different settings like the navigation, voice recognition, sound, display, etc. And then you also do have an optical disk drive up here too. But overall, we've seen this head unit many times before. And I love this head unit. Really great responsiveness. The rendering and the graphics are great too. And it's very user friendly. And the buttons are really clear, easy to read. The font is great. And it's just a really great infotainment system. And you also do have the Infinity Premium Audio Sound System on this bag boy too. Now coming to the TFT instrument cluster, I'm a pretty big fan of it. And we've seen it many times before on many Kia vehicles. But basically it's like a little mini Kia UVO system. You have your digital speedometer right there. And then your exterior temperature readout is on the bottom. And then you have your different driver selectable modes which will appear up on this instrument cluster as well. And then like I said, it's all controlled by the buttons on the steering wheel. And it shows you what radio station you're on. And then your tire pressure as well. And then user settings like your driver assistance, door, tailgate, lights, sound, etc. Now as far as the seats go, the seats are pretty comfortable, great for long wear trips. And I love the nice soft pillowy headrest. And then the side bolstering, there's lots of it. And when I was going around corners in this vehicle, they really hug you in tight. Love the side bolstering. And then the thigh support is pretty good too. Now as far as visibility goes, it's pretty average for the class. There's a decent amount of side glass area. The amp pillar isn't too thick. Outward visibility is okay. And then rearward visibility isn't too shabby either. Alright, and let's go ahead and shut down the Sorento. Let's go ahead and check out the rest of the vehicle. Power tailgate. Now back here you will find a decent amount of cargo capacity if you're comparing this to a compact crossover with the third row folded down. Now to fold it down you just pull this. Easy as that. And then to fold down the second row just pull these levers right here then they come right down. Really easy to do. Like I said, you do have a power tailgate. Now build quality and materials do follow through in the rear back here. Still a nice and soft touch. 
and on the upper door panel too. Great build quality. And you do have a rear sunshade back here. Now these seats do recline and they do slide forward and aft for a more comfortable experience. Now most notably with this new redesign you will definitely find more passenger space especially in the second row. Something that the previous generation was lacking was decent passenger space in the second row. But this one is okay, I have to say. You do have dual map pockets back here, rear air vents, a USB port and a 12 volt power outlet, and you do have an 115 volt power outlet. Rear armrest with cup holders. Seats are pretty comfortable back here, thigh support is okay. Overall it's a pretty comfortable experience. Definitely love that panoramic sunroof. Powered passenger seat with power recline. The glove box, nice and damped. Alrighty. So the Kia Sorento is bigger, more sophisticated, and much more enjoyable to drive for 2016 making it a very appealing alternative to 5 and 7 passenger SUVs that were previously a class above it. Kia's mid-size crossover should definitely be worth putting on your test drive list. I'm in beautiful sunny Los Angeles on my way to the LA Auto Show, which is one of the biggest auto shows worldwide and makes it the perfect place for the world premiere of the new Mercedes Maybach S Class. In just a little while, the car will come out from right there. It will be unveiled. And over here is the press section that is quickly filling up with excited journalists. From the family of the S-Class, the highest quality vehicle in the world, comes a new level of handcrafted refinement, personalization and prestige. The all-new 2016 Mercedes Maybach I'd like S600. for you to point out some of the, the features on this car that you're, you're, you, know, you love the most. Yes. This is our uh, Mercedes Maybach, the top in luxury. You can get the most exclusive car. Uh, the car is about eight inches longer, so it's fairly stretched. Uh, we, we took a lot of effort to balance the car. Such a big car is hard to balance. So we created a new C-pillar, which is more upright, has more volume. Uh, of course, we the Maybach logo adorns. You see what an attention to detail here is with the three-dimensional chrome that wraps around the entire glass areas. And so we create this ultimate in luxury here. The vision was to create a plastic-free interior and we almost The Mercedes Maybach at 16 will launch in America in here, April 2015 at the 2016 model. It will cost tens of thousands more than the 170,000 F60, but it will remain a very significant distance away from the stratospheric stickers of the former Maybach 57 and 62 models. That's it for me here from models. Los Angeles. I'll see you next time. It's a safe approach, but a sensible one, and one that remains respectful to the original Maybach brand. We think there will be quite a few ladies and gentlemen to whom the car will appeal. Okay, here it is, the brand new. The all new 2016 Mercedes Maybach 600. Coming in April 2015, the Mercedes Maybach S600 takes the perfection of the S Class and soars to new heights. The interior is 8 inches longer than the standard S Class, and rear passengers will especially enjoy the generous legroom. Unparalleled comfort and sophistication await throughout, highlighted by hand stitched Nepal leather throughout the interior including the headliner, pillars and entire seats. 
with optional seat buttons, pillows and pillow stitching on the dashboard. All in all, the Mercedes Maybach with offer 7 unique design or interior packages to choose from. In the US, the new car will launch as the Mercedes Maybach S600, fitted with the same 6.0 liter twin turbocharged with 12 Z powers the regular Mercedes Benz S600. It makes 523 horsepower and 612 pounds feet of torque, and viciously runs the car into an electronic governor at 155 miles per hour. Acceleration 62 mile per hour is set to take 5 seconds flat. Other markets will be offered the Mercedes Maybach in 8 cylinder as 550 and 6 cylinder as 400 forms. This including expensive and unique workaround wood trim, Maybach logos on the seat pillar and embossed into the center armrest, with individually milled numbers, completed speaker grids and fiber optic ambient lighting. There is also bar Mr. See the surround sound tweeters in the rear doors that spiral towards passengers and a pair of rope and baking silver plated champagne floats. The rear seats both offer a full range of power adjustability, including a back wrist that can be moved independently of the seat button, a massaging function, and powered cough supports. A footrest can be muttered out of the front passenger seat peg for sleeping or relaxing. Cooling and warming cup holders are available with our articulated tables that unfold from the rear center console. The rear air nozzles are done in a wood finish. Put simply, the car is sumptuous without being garish. When Wonder closes, another opens and welcome to the all new 2016 Mercedes Maybach S600.
What do people look for in a compact seven seat family people carrier? Good build quality, neat packaging, a versatile seating system, a reputation for reliability, and a choice of frugal engines. Toyota's much improved Verso certainly ticks all those boxes. Slowly but surely, Toyota's product range is becoming more desirable. Not only the sporty niche models, but also the more practical cars in the lineup, like this one, the Verso MPV. This is the third generation version of Toyota's compact family sized MPV, a vehicle we first saw in 2001, badged as the Corolla Verso. That model only had five seats, but a seven seat uh, design followed in 2004, before this Mark III version made its debut in 2009, also with up to seven seats, but by now branded purely as Verso. It was an exceptionally competent car, but it wasn't one you'd necessarily try and find reasons to buy, and too often for Toyota's liking, potential customers passed up the opportunity for ownership in favour of more stylish or perhaps more dynamic options in the compact people carrying segment. Hence the need for this revised third generation version, introduced at the end of 2012 and targeted at leaving more of a lasting impression. On the balance sheet, with lower running costs, on the road with extra refinement, re revised suspension and sharper steering, and on your driveway with sharper looks and extra equipment. A car in essence to cover all of your family transport needs, Chapter and Verso, in a way that you'll feel good about. Let's check it out. When it comes to vehicle dynamics, the expectations of family buyers have changed quite a bit since this Verso was first launched in 2009. Back then, it was still quite acceptable for a car of this kind to exhibit a set of largely undemanding driving manners. But other brands have since proved just how much better than that a model in this segment can be. Toyota's engineers needed to try harder while still continuing to satisfy the vast majority of owners simply wanting a comfortable A to B motoring. Essentially, this car needed to feel a bit sharper. It does. The body's more rigid than before and the power steering's being tweaked for extra precision and feel. There's a revised suspension layout too, which will uh, improve comfort and stability. And the difference all this makes? Well, if you own the original version of this uh, third generation Verso, it shouldn't be long before you notice it. Pressing on through a series of bends, the car will feel more confident and agile. And even in uh, more relaxed motoring when you're cornering, the reduction in body roll will keep your passengers happier. They'll like the fact that it's quieter too. That stiffer body, sleeker styling and extra soundproofing see to that, ensuring that vibrations are far less intrusive, even at motorway speeds where it's no longer necessary to raise your voice to communicate with passengers in the rearmost row. Not even in the diesel version that most customers choose. There's no longer a D4D 180 variant, uh, a really pokey diesel. So uh, diesel Verso buyers must now be content with a 122 brake horsepower version of the familiar two litre unit. Like all Versos, it'll get you from rest to 62 miles an hour in 11 seconds on the way to a top speed of 115 miles an hour. If that's performance that you'd like to achieve through petrol power, then there are a couple of Valvematic options. Either a uh, 130 brake horsepower manual 1.6, or a 145 brake horsepower multi-drive S automatic 1.8. Here though, I've got the diesel, which thanks to 310 newton meters of torque, feels the quickest of the trio in ordinary day-to-day -day driving. Toyota is keen to stress that the changes to this third generation Verso go a bit deeper than is usual with a mid-term facelift wash and brush up. In all, over 470 parts have been changed, 60% of them visible, and the car is also 20 millimetres longer than before. What you'll notice most, though, is the brand's latest family face, the so-called keen look we first saw on the company's second-generation Auris family hatch. 
It certainly gives this Verso a more purposeful stance, dominated at the front end by this large trapezoidal lower grille set within a redesigned bumper, and this smaller upper grille, which features a chrome-plated horizontal trim bar that runs the full width between sleeker headlamp units that incorporate daytime running lights. Moving to the side, where there are smaller, more aerodynamically efficient door mirrors, the trademark dual zone styling remains much as before, with a strong character line that sweeps from the leading edge of the front bumper, then flows upwards through the rear doors and the rear pillar to define the line of the rear roof-mounted spoiler. It all nicely sets off uh, rearward styling that, as at the front, includes extra chrome decoration, a revised bumper, and smarter rear light clusters. Now, what hasn't changed are the essential dimensions of this car, wheelbase height width, which means that there's no more room inside. So, as with virtually all compact seven-seat MPVs, this Third row seating is really intended for children. If you really must put adults here, then you'll find it fortunate that these seats recline. To keep bigger folk happy, even on short journeys though, you're probably going to need to go a bit further than that and persuade those in this middle seating row to make use of the 195 millimetres of backwards and forwards sliding range that's on offer to enable some kind of passenger legroom compromise to be reached. Now, this second row is made up of three individual sliding seats, which my kids really liked. They also appreciated this optional Skyview panoramic roof and were pleased to find plenty of storage spaces, including these underfloor compartments and seat back storage beneath stowable aviation style fold out tables. There's plenty of storage space up front too with a spacious center console box uh, decently sized door pockets and a twin compartment glove box with a cooled upper section that's big enough to hold a 1.5 litre bottle plus an 8.2 litre lower section. In other words, everything is just as sensible as it was before with the so-called smart wave dynamism dashboard design placing the gear lever comfortably close to the steering wheel, just where you'd want it. What's different though with this improved Verso is that all this sense and sensibility is a good deal easier to live with thanks to a range of tasteful trim improvements, notably the softer satin black paint finish and the warm satin chromed highlights that you'll find everywhere from the air vents to around the centrally positioned instrument cluster. And boot space, well, with all seven seats occupied, and that's an unlikely scenario for most buyers, you get 155 litres here. Though there is an 11 litre underfloor compartment uh, that's enough to hold three six pack cases of 1.5 litre plastic bottles. Use the neat Toyota Easy Flat seating system that uh, is said to provide up to 32 seating permutations and fold this third row into the floor and you increase your likely carriage capacity to 440 litres. In seven seat models that rises to 982 litres with the middle seat also folded to create a totally flat surface that's 1575 millimetres long and 1430 millimetres wide. For some time now, Toyota's pricing has been sharpening against its rivals, and here's another case in point. Expect to pay somewhere in the 18 to 24,000 pound bracket for your Verso, which makes this car very competitively priced indeed. Only the base trimmed entry level petrol 1.6 offers the five seat only layout that very few potential buyers will want, given that a seven seat version is only 500 pounds more. 
around half of all potential Verso buyers will want to pay the £1,500 premium necessary to graduate from the petrol 1.6 to the 2-litre D4D diesel variant I have here, a car and engine combination that's priced from around £21,500. If you're a petrol person and want to know how much more it would be to graduate up from the base manual 1.6 to the automatic multi-drive S 1.8, the answer is £1,500. That stacks up very well against the obvious opposition in the seven-seat compact MPV sector. If you're looking at a Verso in seven-seat petrol 1.6-litre guys, uh, a Verso would save you around £500 over an equivalent 1.6-litre Vauxhall Zafira or Peugeot 5008, just over £1,000 over a 1.2-litre TSI Volkswagen Touran, just over £2,000 over a comparable Ford Grand C-Max 1.0-litre T EcoBoost 125PS, and just over £3,000 over a comparable Renault Grand Scenic 1.2 TCE. And none of these alternatives can match the base petrol Toyota's 130 bhp output or its performance. It's a similar story when it comes to comparisons with the Verso 2-litre D4D diesel that I've been trying here. It offers more power and performance than most of the opposition and is more competitively priced, saving you around £600 on a Peugeot 5008 1.6-litre HDI, around £1,500 on the most affordable diesel versions of cars like Volkswagen's Touran, Ford's Grand C-Max, Vauxhall's Zafira or the Mazda 5, and nearly £3,000 on the most affordable diesel-powered Renault Grand Scenic. If, having considered all of this, you conclude that it is a Verso that your family really needs, then regardless of your choice between 1.6 or 1.8 litre petrol power, or indeed this 2 litre D4D diesel, you'll be expecting a decent level of specification to be included as standard. Which is largely true, though the real niceties like alloy wheels, roof rails and the Toyota Touch infotainment system with Bluetooth and a rear parking camera only start at mid-range trim level. Go for a baseline variant and you get, well, the basics. Daytime running lights, front fog lamps, a Thatcham Category 1 alarm, power windows and mirrors, air conditioning that also cools the upper glove box, a four-speaker stereo with steering wheel mounted controls, a USB jack and an aux in connectivity point, plus a trip computer and hill start assist control to stop you from drifting backwards on uphill junctions. Options I'd want to consider uh, include upgrading the Toyota Touch infotainment system to touch and go status so that it includes sat-nav. I'd also want to look at things like the Skyview panoramic glass roof, a cargo liner, a reversible boot mat and a large 360 litre roof box for holiday trips. Standard safety stuff includes twin front side and curtain airbags plus a driver's knee bag. There are also ISOFIX child seat fastenings, anti-whiplash head restraints and all the usual electronic assistance features for braking, traction and stability control to justify a five-star rating in Euro NCAP's independent crash tests. In terms of running costs, you might think that because this Verso campaigns with a 2-litre D4D diesel engine against comparable rivals with 1.6-litre diesel units, then it might be at a disadvantage. But in actual fact, the figures are very, very class competitive. This uh, D4D Verso managing 57.6 miles to the gallon on the combined cycle and putting out 129 grams per kilometre of CO2. And that's slightly better, in fact, than you'll get from uh, comparable 1.6-litre diesel versions of the Peugeot 5008 and the Mazda 5. As for the petrol models, well, a 1.6-litre petrol uh, Verso manages 42.8 miles to the gallon on the combined cycle and 154 grams per kilometre of CO2, which is slightly better than a 1.6-litre petrol-powered Vauxhall Zafira or Peugeot uh, 5008. It's a bit tougher to find direct competitors for the automatic only Verso Petrol 1.8 Multi-Drive S. But uh, its returns, 41.5 miles to the gallon on the combined cycle and 159 grams per kilometre of CO2, are quite on a par with much pricier um, rivals like Volkswagen's Touran 1.4 TSI 140 DSG. 
You can always buy a Toyota and feel reasonably confident that it's not going to cripple you financially with repair bills as soon as the long five-year warranty runs out. The used car market too has a healthy respect for the Japanese manufacturer's reliability record and depreciation levels are softened as a result. Buyers can also choose the Toyota Access System which gives you a guaranteed buyback price at the end of your ownership term and fixed price servicing deals. Insurance groupings range between 13 and 17. The Verso has always been a car you bought because it made sense. This one though does a bit more than that. Its compact seven seat family layout still ruthlessly ticks almost every practical box. And it remains a solidly appealing, take it as you find it, get the job done kind of vehicle that's thoroughly user friendly, especially with its easy to operate seating system. As before, you'll find that almost nothing will go wrong and that everything will feel just right. All that we've known since the third generation version of this Toyota was first launched in 2009. The difference now though comes with the injection of a little extra luxury and a lot of extra personality. True, those won't be the things that will have first prompted you to buy a people carrier, but in a closely fought market where every contender seems similarly specced, they're the things that can make the difference. And they've created in this car a smarter, quieter, more efficient, more comfortable, and just plain better Verso. Overall, there are still few more practical, better built or more reliable choices in this segment. It's just that now you can make a head choice with a bit of heart too. Kia has been on a roll, changing its brand image with models like the luxurious K900 and the sporty Stinger. Now it's time to bring some of that DNE down market to the brand's compact sedan, the Forte. I'm Jared here with CarBuzz.com, and today I am on the first drive event here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania for the all new 2019 Kia Forte. As we can see already, just from looking at this car on the outside, it bears a striking resemblance to the sporty Kia. Although, I don't want to get too crazy and buy Kia's words. I do see a lot of Stinger DNA in the taillights. You have that connected rear taillight design that was clearly influenced by the Stinger. You've got those sporty looking 17 inch wheels on this model. I've been driving around the EX Launch Edition, which is the priciest of all of the Forte models, although still pretty affordable as I'll tell you later. And then up front, we can clearly see some Stinger DNA. It has the new Kia corporate grille that was first seen on the Stinger and is now on most of Kia's models, if not all of them. I think this is a really, really handsome car. I'll try and show you with the lights on. I think it looks even better with the DRLs turned on. And the big story here is value. I think that this car is gonna be a great value for a lot of people. Kia says that a lot of first time buyers are gonna be looking at this Forte and I do not blame them. So under the hood sits a two liter four cylinder engine with 147 horsepower and 132 foot pounds of torque. Those aren't in crazy insane numbers, but again, this is not a class of really, really sporty vehicles, so that's not too bad. Uh, with 147 horsepower, you're going to get excellent, excellent gas mileage, 31 mpg in the city, 41 mpg on the highway, and around 35 combined. I've been driving like a bit of a lunatic, but I've still averaged about 31 mpg on this drive. There's also a manual option, only on the base model, unfortunately. So if you uh, like to have a lot of options and row your own gears, you're gonna have to settle for the base FE with the manual transmission that starts at around $17,690. You can get a manual. It's gonna hurt your fuel economy. You'll only get 27 in the city, 37 on the highway, and around 31 combined. This model that we have here is the new CVT. 
Now, this is the first ever CVT used in a Hyundai Kia product. It was developed in-house. I'm going to talk a little bit about it later when I go out and drive this car. A lot of people are going to bemoan the fact that they got rid of the six-speed and went for a CVT but I think this is one of the best CVTs I have ever driven, and I do mean that. All right, so now I'm going to step on the inside where the it's pretty spacious on the inside. This is 80 millimeters longer than the outgoing Forte. It's also wider as well. The interior is really, really nice on this car. Uh, like I said, we have the EXL trim is what we've been driving, which is EX Launch Edition. This one's a little bit different than the production launch edition that you'll be able to buy. There are different wheels. Uh, the, it'll be basically these same wheels, although they'll be in gray. And the only color on the launch edition is going to be orange. And there's a couple features I'll talk about that are key on this launch edition. And even fully loaded as we have it here, it's only going to be $25,200, which is pretty good considering all of the standard kit that you get. So now I'm going to come in and step inside where a lot of that Stinger DNA carries over. This screen looks very, very familiar to anybody who's been in a Stinger recently. Down here, we have dual zone automatic climate control standard on every single Forte model. That is fantastic. We have a keyless entry. I'm going to go ahead and start it up. Unfortunately, that's only available on a couple of the high trim models. They do not make that a standard option, which is a bit unfortunate. I wish that they would uh, maybe make that more of, you know, towards the base models. Unfortunately, not all of the models have that. We do have these nice, clear, concise black with white gauges. Uh, you have a little helper screen here. You can have your fuel economy, your map information. We do have built-in navigation here on this top trim. But even if you don't get it, Android Auto and Apple CarPlay are standard. We have some of our driver assistance functions. This car is pretty darn loaded when it comes to safety features. Kia says that all uh, Fortes are going to come standard with things like lane keep assist and forward collision warning. We have blind spot monitoring as well. We also have active lane keep assist. So if you take your hands off the wheel, you can start to see it moving by itself, although it will beep and tell you to put your hands back on the wheel. We also have adaptive cruise, although it does not bring you to a full stop. It shuts off at about 20 or so miles an hour. The materials in here are all pretty nice. You know, this isn't like a high, uh, a, that high of a class of car. So most of the cars in this segment don't have super luxurious materials, but Kia does an amazing job of making these cheap materials look and feel pretty good. There are a couple of hard touch plastic zones, but this is softer. Uh, down here is pretty soft as well. There are plenty of soft touch zones. The steering wheel is this nice, I doubt that it's real leather, but it feels like it really nice. These uh, leather seats that we have actually aren't real leather they're man-made but they're really really nice and if you go for anything above the XE trim or EX trim excuse me you will get ventilated seats as well as heated seats that is one of the only cars in this entire segment that has that and they do work a treat on a hot day I think the Volkswagen Jetta may be the only other car in this segment that even offers those so fantastic on Kia for offering that as an available feature on this car. We also have the key wireless charging over here. If you have a phone, that'll accept that. And there's plenty of storage space. You also have a lower storage area here. So on a small car like this, to have that much storage to put your keys and your phone and other stuff is absolutely great. I love how Kia utilizes the space here. There's also a sunroof on this car. So I'm gonna go ahead and talk a little bit about the pricing. For that, I'm going to get out of the car, and I'm going to take a moment just to show you the key fob here. Uh, it is strikingly resembling the Stinger key, which is very, very cool. It's not circular up the top, but it is kind of like that detonator shifter that we loved on the Stinger. Very, very cool. So now let's talk about pricing. As I mentioned a little earlier, the base FE with a manual transmission is $17,690. Very affordable for somebody buying a first car. Uh, the automatic transmission is going to run you $18,590, so about $1,000 more. The LXS trim is $19,000. Uh, 90. 
The S trim, is, which I've seen a couple of them on this launch, is 20,190. And then the trim that you're gonna wanna look at is the EX trim. I think that is the best value. That is 21,990. That's gonna get you the, the leatherette seats, heated and ventilation. You're gonna get that smart key like we have. You're also gonna get a smart trunk, where if you hold the key and walk up to the car, with the trunk closed, it will open automatically. And then there's that EX launch tr trim, which is what we are driving here right now. That's uh, $25,200. That is the priciest, uh, although you do get adaptive cruise control, a sunroof, you get uh, LED running lights, you get that wireless charger and the built-in nav. So I would say a good way to save a little over three grand is to get that EX trim because it comes basically how I like it. But this EX launch edition is very nice as well. I'm gonna show you the back seat, which is pretty darn roomy. I haven't really had a chance to uh, use it all that much, but I am gonna sit back here and show you how it feels. Sitting behind myself, even in this small car, I have plenty of uh, knee room. I have plenty of uh, headroom as well. There is an air vent back here, which is pretty nice on a compact car like this. Now I'm gonna get out. I'll show you, I believe there's also an armrest here. It folds out and has two basic cup holders. Now I'm gonna show you the trunk, which is pretty darn big. If I can find the opening for it. There it is. You can see in there. It's pretty darn big. It does have 60 foldy, 60 40 folding rear seats, and you just pull these little tabs to get those to go down. All right, so now I'm gonna go ahead and take it on, on the road and tell you how that two liter engine matches with that CVT transmission and whether or not this is a car that enthusiasts are going to actually want to drive. Okay, so I was invited here to Pittsburgh to drive this Kia Forte, and I've been driving around all day, and my driving impressions overall are extremely positive of this compact sedan. Now, it's not going to blow you away with power or ride and handling or any of those sort of things. It's not really that type of car. This is much in line with a Civic or a Corolla or an Elantra, but I think that it does a lot of things better than a lot of those cars. So here are the big changes. This is an all new car, but the big change here is this CVT automatic transmission. The old second generation Kia Forte had a six speed automatic. So how does that differ? Well, as I mentioned earlier, you're gonna get really darn good fuel economy using this CVT. However, one of the big problems with CVTs is they moan and they groan and and they don't really feel like an automatic when you really mash the throttle. And I've driven a lot of CVTs recently that kind of fix that problem where they kind of feel like gears when you're driving it normally. And then when you really get on it, you know, you start to feel that it's a CVT. I'm gonna give it a little throttle mash here. over some rough pavement, and I promise you, it sort of just feels like the gears happen to just be really long, so when you floor it from a stop, again, this is not a very, very fast car, so it kind of just feels like it winds out, and it just kind of feels like you're going through some really long gears. I'm going to try it one more time. There you go. See? When it finally does reach the top of the RPM range, it really does sound like it's simulating a gear. This is one of the best CBTs that I have driven. I am deeply impressed by it. It has seven faux gears. I've put it in its manual mode here and shifted through them that way too. And I genuinely think that this is one of the closest CVTs I've ever felt to feeling like a true automatic. So that's very good on Kia's part that they were able to do that on their first go. Good for you, Kia. I'm very proud of this transmission. There is a six-speed manual option as well. I haven't driven it. It's only available on the base trim, so I can't imagine that it's really that fun of a manual. Kia says the take rate's going to be only around 5%. So you can go ahead and try and find one of those at your local dealer. 
regular, although, to be honest, this is not a very fast car, and I don't think that the six-speed manual is going to add all of that much enjoyment to it. The steering is very, very light. Uh, it's really easy to maneuver around tight back roads, around parking spots, all of that. I, I like the steering. It's not the most involving that I've driven, but it's nowhere near uh, a snooze fest either. We had some fun roads on our route here in Pittsburgh, and you do get some genuine steering feel. I put it in sport mode. I, I think it gets a little heavier. It's kind of hard to tell. Kia has sort of done away with that whole gimmick of where the steering would get really heavy when you put it in sport mode. But yeah, I really like the steering weight. I think most people are going to be very, very happy with it. I, I could even tolerate this as an enthusiast who really likes good steering feel. I think it feels pretty darn good. Another point of contention might be the torsion beam rear suspension. So instead of having an independent rear suspension, it's just a beam across the rear axle. And you start to notice it when the roads get really crappy. And Kia must have been really confident that they built a really, really comfortable car here because Pittsburgh has some doozies of roads that are really torn up, really terrible, big potholes. And when you go over the biggest of potholes, you start to feel the car shake and shimmy a little bit. Not too bad. It's nothing terrible. I would never complain too much about it, but you do notice it when you're over really, really rough pavement. If you live somewhere where there's smooth roads, I think the ride of this car is actually fantastic. It rides like a class above. It's a compact car, so it competes against cars like the Civic and Elantra, but I think this rides as well as a Sonata or even an Optima or, you know, a Camry. I think it rides that well. It's very, very smooth on the highway, very quiet as well. This CVT does not really have a lot of moaning and groaning when you're at highway speeds. I really do like the way this car feels. The seats that I'm sitting in on this top trim are these leatherette. They're not real leather, but it's a nice material. I think it's fine. It, it feels very dirty durable and the good thing about it is there's a little bit of bolstering it's nothing crazy it's not a sport seat by any stretch of the imagination but it holds you in nice over over corners and I would be happy to sit in this car for a really long period of time and as I mentioned earlier if you get the EX trim or above you're going to get heated and ventilated seats which is not the only car in this class that does that but one of the only cars that does that and that makes this car an incredible value. I think that this Forte represents one of the best values in this class right now. I think it looks good on the outside. I love the interior design. I love how I have all of this storage space for all of my stuff. And the way it drives is pretty good as well. So I'm in my short time with the Forte, I know I haven't had it too long. I am deeply, deeply impressed with it, and I'm going to give it a recommendation of must-buy. I think if you're looking for a compact sedan and you want something affordable that's going to give you those features to make you feel like you just bought a luxury car, this is the car for you. And if you're, you know, a 16-year-old or an 18-year-old and you're shopping for your first wheels and you have about $22,000, Oh my goodness, the amount of stuff that you're getting in this is ridiculous for a first car. So I, I would be genu genuinely happy to have this as a first car. I think it's great, and that's why it gets a recommendation of must-buy from me. And if you've enjoyed this video and you'd like to see more like it, subscribe to the Car Buzz Unboxing YouTube channel and be sure to follow us on all of the social media platforms, including Instagram and Twitter. And be sure to download our app on iOS and Android to keep up with all of the latest and greatest in automotive news and to read all of our reviews like the, my full written review of this 2019 Kia Forte. Hope you've enjoyed the video. See you next time. Nobody knows a thing or two about roadsters, and this improved second generation Z4 is one of its best. It may not be the sharpest car in its class to drive, but on the right day, in the right mood, on the right road, you may not care, provided you're a fan of metal folding roofs. The engines are efficient and willing, the looks are still stunning, and the feeling you get behind the wheel still makes you feel 20 years younger. 
maturing extremely well, this, it seems, is a Z that remains very hard to catch. So to this improved version of BMW's second generation Z4 Roadster. Now, back at its original launch in 2009, the Munich maker set itself quite a challenge with this car. After all, the company's marketing stance as builder of the ultimate driving machine seemed unlikely to be underlined by equipping its affordable roadster for the first time with a heavy folding metal roof. Yet that's exactly what we've got in a car that in its segment sits somewhere between the elegant cruiser that is Mercedes SLK and the sporting appeal of a Porsche Boxster. Now it's smarter, faster and more efficient. Plus there's a lower powered entry level S-Drive 18i variant to make it more affordable. That metal folding roof tells you a lot about BMW's target market for this model. If it had been gunning primarily for Boxster buyers, then the Bavarians might have been able to resist the fashionable demand for automotive metal tops that flip down like Swiss army knives. As it was, they felt that the Z4 simply had to have one to properly compete. And as usual, their design team did the best possible job with the tools available. By early 2013 though, new arrivals were stealing the limelight in the Roadster sector, hence the introduction of this updated model. A car we're going to put to the test. This may be a fashionable Roadster, but it isn't a car for ladies who lunch. Slip into the low slung seat and drop the roof and your eyes are virtually on a level with the long vented bonnet. You're ready. It certainly feels like the real deal, especially if you have a growly six cylinder engine plumbed in up front. The chances are though that you won't have. Sporting BMWs may have been inseparably associated with six cylinder engines down the years, but most of the power plants on offer in this improved Z4 lineup squirt fuel into the quartet of cylinders boasted by a twin power turbo 2 litre unit that's offered in three states of tune. The 184 brake horsepower S Drive 20i and 245 brake horsepower S Drive 28i variants are carried over from before, but in an attempt to snare customers who might otherwise have to settle for cheaper segment rivals like the Mazda MX-5 or the Mini Roadster. BMW has introduced a more affordable Z4 starter model in the form of the 156 brake horsepower S-Drive 18i that I'm trying here. If at this point you're expecting me to suggest that less is more, then I'm afraid you're going to be disappointed. When spec changes are taken into account, the S-Drive 18i, the one that I'm driving here, will save you very little over the S-Drive 20i that 80% of Z4 customers choose. It's no more frugal to run, there's less pulling power on offer, and its 7.9 second 0-62 mile an hour sprint time is a second slower. Arguably the sweet spot in the range though is occupied by the ultimate four-cylinder model, the S-Drive 28i, which fires you past the 62 mile an hour benchmark in 5.7 seconds on the way to a top speed that has to be reined in at 155 miles an hour. The two 3 litre inline twin turbo six cylinder models are similarly restricted. The 306 brake horsepower S Drive 35i and the 340 brake horsepower S Drive 35i S respectively able to demolish the 0-62 mile an hour sprint in 5.2 and 4.8 seconds. In contrast to Audi and Mercedes, BMW doesn't think that you'll want a diesel option. Unlike the 3 Series convertible, the first car BMW made with a metal folding roof, this Z4 has managed to retain the German brand's famed 50-50 weight distribution with the roof up. But ironically, it's driving as I am now with the roof down and the extra weight over the rear wheels that the rear wheel drive chassis feels most responsive. There's virtually no body roll and uh, in the dry at least, you rarely run out of grip. The brakes are great too. On the downside, the manual gear shift action, well, it could be a little smoother. And it's a pity that the steering doesn't have a bit more feel, though 
at least it's accurate and always enables you to place the car precisely. Roof down, of course, it's a different story, but many will see the blustery feel as part of the fun of owning a car of this kind. All Z4s come with BMW's drive performance control system. Here, via Focus Sport and relaxed comfort settings, you can set your car up to your own preferences, just like a race team would on a race car. That means altering the response of throttle, steering, stability control, and even the gear change times. If you've opted for the eight-speed automatic or the full-blown MDCT seven-speed twin clutch auto transmission, that's the only choice for S-Drive 35i S buyers. If you paid extra for the adaptive M Sport suspension setup that I have here, the drive performance control settings can also alter the suspension settings and therefore the ride comfort. If you've ticked this box, then you'll find that an extra Sport Plus setting is added to the system, which lowers the car by 10 millimeters, firming things up still further for racetrack use and offering 10% more driver leeway before the stability control cuts in. Four wheels, two seats, and a big engine. It doesn't get much simpler than that. Like any classic Roadster, more than half the length is given over to the engine, which is one reason why there's only space enough for a couple of passengers. As to the changes made to this revised version, well, they don't amount to very much. The headlights now include white LED corona rings and a white eyebrow with additional chrome detailing, while in profile, the side gill features chrome detailing and LED side repeater lights. Otherwise things are much as before with subtle styling flourishes like this indented V set into the bonnet running like a ribbon snagged on the badge. Neat detailing then and neat packaging too. You'd certainly expect the inclusion of a two-piece electro-hydraulic metal folding roof to have altered this Z4's appearance a good deal more than it has but there are no awkward looks, no telltale bulky rear end. BMW's design team uh, couldn't work miracles though, and in return for the security of a hard top, you have to accept a couple of significant drawbacks. First, the speed of operation. Now this top takes around 20 seconds to lower or raise. That's about twice as long as the roof on a fabric topped Audi TT Roadster. At least you can operate it at speeds of up to 20 miles an hour though. The other issue rather predictably concerns boot space. Now it's fine when the roof's up with 310 litres on offer. When the top's retracted though, that figure falls to just 180 litres. That's uh, about 25% less than you get in a rival Mercedes SLK. Annoyingly, you have to pay extra for the comfort access option, which enables you to raise this folded roof sandwich slightly to get hold of bulky stuff you put in the boot when the roof is up, but which otherwise becomes trapped there when the roof is down. Now many owners, will want to avoid this problem by using the 15.5 litre interior storage area provided behind the seats. And having said all that, this Z4 does have the useful option of a ski hatch through which you can poke a set of shortish skis or perhaps more ambitiously, uh, a set of golf clubs. And behind the wheel, well, settle comfortably into the low slung seat and it all feels just right. Your eyes pretty much on a level with the long vented bonnet in front, tempting you to lift the seat right up to try and see over it. The snug wraparound dash is much as before, and there are some lovely unique to Z4 touches like these clustered climate control dials. As you'd expect for the premium money being asked, everything is beautifully built from the highest quality materials plus the extra head, shoulder and elbow room that have been built into the current generation Z4 model give it an area cabin feel than some of its competitors. 
List prices suggest that, allowing for a few well-chosen extras, you'll probably be paying somewhere in the 28 to 46,000 pound bracket for your Z4. Almost all BMW's business here is done with the four-cylinder, two-litre petrol engine that powers the S-Drive 18i, 20i and 28i variants, leading to an average Z4 purchase price in the 30 to 35,000 pound bracket. There's a 5,000 pound step up from that if you want one of the three-litre six-cylinder models priced in the 40 to 45,000 pound bracket. From this selection, eight out of every 10 Z4 buyers opt for the S-Drive 20i variant, which has been priced precisely against the only other roads to rival in this segment to feature a metal folding roof. That car, the Mercedes SLK 200, is a directly comparable choice in almost every way, and your decision between the two will largely come down to personal preference. I should point out, though, that the Z4 range gives you more options. In the mainstream SLK lineup, Mercedes gives you only one mainstream choice at either four or six cylinder level. The six cylinder SLK 350 variant isn't as competitively priced either, adding around 5,000 pounds onto the price of a comparable Z4 35i, yet offering no more performance. Are there any other brands competing in this little market niche? Audi is probably the most obvious one that springs to mind, and if you don't mind exchanging a metal folding top for a fabric one, you could certainly consider the Ingolstadt company's TT Roadster. The TT 1.8 and 2 litre TFSI variants will save you two to three thousand pounds on their directly comparable Z4 S-Drive 18i and 20i alternatives, but further up the range, TTS and TT RS models are actually slightly pricier than directly comparable Z4 S-Drive 28i and 35iS rivals. And beyond Audi and Mercedes? Well, to be honest, there isn't much. If you're looking at the six-cylinder variants and don't want a top TT or SLK, the other obvious choice is the Porsche Boxster, but one of those will be pricey by the time you've finalised your spec and, like the TT Roadster, you're limited to a fabric roof. At the other end of the scale, at four-cylinder level, this most affordable S-Drive 18i variant has been introduced to temp buyers who might be looking at a smaller, less prestigiously badged model in this segment. For only slightly less, after all, you could have a faster but fabric-roofed mini Roadster John Cooper Works or a metal folding topped Mazda MX-5 Roadster. Both, though, lack the quality feel that you get in this BMW. My personal Z4 choice would be the fastest four-cylinder version, the 245 brake horsepower S-Drive 28i. But to go for one of those, you'd have to be immune to the charms of using the same kind of £35,000 budget to get yourself something like a top Lotus Elise, fun but crude, the Nissan 370Z Roadster, old-school rear-wheel drive thrills but high running costs, or Volkswagen's Golf R Cabriolet, practical but dull in comparison. If, having considered all of this, you conclude that it is a Z4 that you really, really want, then you're going to want to know what BMW includes in the standard equipment tally. And the answer is a reasonable amount, as well as the power folding roof and drive performance control. Buyers of this entry-level S-Drive 18i get 17-inch alloy wheels on run-flat tyres, Xenon headlights with daytime driving lamps, a Thatcham Category 1 alarm, a proper heated rear window, a multifunction leather trim sports steering wheel, a BMW professional stereo system with DAB digital radio plus USB and aux in inputs, Bluetooth phone compatibility, and a trip computer. It's hard though, here at the bottom of the Z4 lineup, not to focus on what you have to do without. After all, if you add the leather trim, air conditioning, auto headlamps and rain sensing wipers that all other Z4 models get, you get within 400 pounds of the pleasingly more powerful Z-Drive 20i variant. My test car has all of this, plus a number of key options that many buyers will want. Larger 18-inch alloy wheels, the adaptive M Sport suspension, heated sports seats, brushed aluminium trim to lift the interior, and the BMW professional media package with satellite navigation. 
There's also the comfort access option to make it easier to get things in and out of the boot when the roof's down, and a through loading storage bag. Both of these items are uh, things that really should be standard. I'd say the same about the wind deflector that's part of the comfort package that I have fitted here. Something that uh, also includes cruise control, an auto dimming mirror and parking sensors. Problem is, all of the extra items I've just mentioned add around £10,000 to the cost of the car, leaving the buyer of this particular example facing a total asking price not far off the kind of S-Drive 35i six-cylinder Z4 that would offer twice as much power. Talking of options, another tempting one is the Pure Traction Design Package, which gives you Alcantara and leather trim sports seats, anthracite roof headlining, and a unique metal weave interior trim. Safety-wise, you get twin front and side airbags, protective rollover hoops, and Isofix child seat fastenings, plus all the expected electronic aids for stability and traction, along with a braking system that includes CBC cornering brake control, DBC dynamic brake control, and brake assist to help in emergency stops. These days, even barnstorming sports cars need to keep running costs in check while treating the environment with kid gloves. The Z4 does a better job of this than you'd credit for a car in such a lofty performance bracket, mainly thanks to BMW's efficient dynamics program. Now this takes the form of a collection of innovations which improve a car's efficiency. There's brake energy regeneration, low rolling resistance tyres, electric servotronic power steering, and on-demand control of the engine's ancillaries. With this car, BMW has also adhered closely to a philosophy of lightweight construction, with the front suspension and the subframe being largely made from aluminium. Most importantly, four-cylinder variants get auto start-stop, which cuts the engine when you don't need it, stuck in traffic or waiting at the lights. Thanks to all of this, assuming that you keep an eye on the optimal gear shift indicator, uh, you should be able to get somewhere close to a combined cycle figure, which for the four-cylinder engine is quoted at 41.5 miles to the gallon whichever state of tune you order it in, S-Drive 18i, S-Drive 20i or S-Drive 28i. These figures are also identical to those of rival Mercedes SLK 200 and Audi TT Roadster 2 litre TFSI models. If you're shopping at the upper end of the Z4 four-cylinder lineup, the prospect of an S-Drive 28i model capable of getting to 62 miles an hour in around five and a half seconds, yet with restrained use, still able to return over 40 miles to the gallon is a tempting one. As for the six-cylinder models, well, it might be a little surprising at first glance to find that the 340 brake horsepower S-Drive 35i S actually outperforms the 306 brake horsepower S-Drive 35i. But that's because the flagship variant comes only with the more efficient seven-speed DCT paddle shift auto transmission. With this installed, the S-Drive 35i's returns, those are 30.1 miles to the gallon and 219 grams per kilometre, are marginally improved to 31.4 miles to the gallon and 210 grams per kilometre. That's still some way off what you'll get in a rival Mercedes SLK 350 though. What else? Well, insurance groups range between 33 and 43, and you can expect strong residuals that'll be close to the 50% mark after three years or 36,000 miles. There's also a great value prepaid servicing pack that covers scheduled maintenance for five years and 50,000 miles. BMW has been building roadsters for over 80 years and it shows with this improved second generation Z4, a model that's matured extremely well slowly and methodically developing into an all-rounder that's tough to beat. In fact, I can't help feeling that this is probably the ideal car of its kind for most potential buyers. True, it isn't the driver's machine that, say, a Porsche Boxster can be, but it gets close enough for many likely customers to start prioritising the lower pricing and 
security-minded metal folding roof that come with this BMW. As for the most recent changes made to the lineup, well, slotting in this affordable model at the entry-level point has certainly kept the Z4 relevant to customers with tighter budgets. And while 156 brake horsepower might not instantly bring to mind an ultimate driving machine, even this model has enough about it to entertain. Further up the range, of course, power is plentiful. And if you like your oral fireworks, the inline six-cylinder variants sound glorious. What it all means is that though the Z4 might not be the first car you look at when choosing a sports roadster, look at it you must. It's now just too good not to. So if you guys welcome back to another one if you are new to the channel i am gold pony today we are in the new 2019 ford mustang ecoboost courtesy of bob ruth ford in dillsburg pa and i am excited to be in this one today because it has been like two weeks since i've driven my mustang gt because of the cold weather and the summer tires that i have on and i try not to take it out when it's freezing outside like today nonetheless let me jump right into this and as always let's start with pricing and so there will be several different for trim levels available for the 2019 Mustang EcoBoost. First one being your standard fastback, that is gonna start at $26,120. Then there is the premium fastback for $31,135. Convertible is gonna start at $31,620. And lastly, the premium convertible, that one is gonna start at $36,635. But regardless of trim level, power plant on the 2019 Mustang EcoBoost will be the same. Powering this one is going to be a 2.3 turbocharged inline four-cylinder engine putting out 310 horsepower at 5500 rpm 350 pound-feet of torque available at around 3000 rpm power is going to be sent to the rear wheels of course through either your choice of either a standard six-speed manual or the optional 10-speed automatic with paddle shifters by the way that one adds around sixteen hundred dollars to the price tag but that is the one we have today so you can bet we will be testing out those paddle shifters in a little bit here but in the end, zero to 60 time is going to come in at approximately 4.8 to 5.1 seconds. I usually see it in that ballpark. And that depends on the transmission as well. The 10 speed is going to get you to 60 a little bit faster than the six speed. And when it comes to MPGs, the Mustang EcoBoost is going to give you 21 in the city, 32 on the highway using premium unleaded fuel. But so that before we do any kind of accelerations in the Mustang EcoBoost, I did want to mention the driving modes available via toggle switches just in front of the shifter there. But those driving modes are going to come with the 101A pack package that we do indeed have today and that's available with the standard Mustang EcoBoost or if you go with the premium trim level it is also going to give you those driving modes but what you have to choose from there is normal sport plus track drag strip mode and snow and wet as well and that's going to adjust things like the throttle response and the shift points of course if you go with the 10 speed automatic and there is a button just to the left of that driving mode button it has a steering wheel on it that's going to give you different steering feels including normal sport and comfort I usually leave it in sport my own Mustang because it does give you a heavier feel to the steering wheel and you gotta love that. But anyway, since I mentioned all those driving modes, let's do a quick little acceleration test with the paddle shifters. We'll do both at the same time here and let's see how quickly we can get the 2019 Mustang EcoBoost here up to speed. as quick as the GT but I will say quite a bit of pull and you got to keep in mind it is over 300 horsepower 350 pound-feet of torque so it is definitely going to be a quick car even faster when it's warmer out you can get some traction unlike today where it's 32 degrees but paddle shifters did have a slight delay when it comes to reaction times but still not bad there either and if you did decide to take the Mustang EcoBoost to the drag strip did want to mention you will get electronic line lock as well which is basically where it locks up the front wheels and allows the 
back wheels to completely run free, helping you warm up the tires, of course, before you actually hit the gas. But after you do that, put it in that drag strip mode, and that's gonna keep the RPMs in the sweet spot throughout the acceleration here in the 10 speed. And that should give you a pretty nice time when it comes to the quarter mile. But to go along with that acceleration, as I always have to mention, braking is equally important. And so up front, you will find 12.5 inch front rotors with dual piston front calipers in the back. Once again, 12.5 inch rear rotors with single piston calipers. And since we have a stop sign coming up here, let's test out the braking feel. Wow, definitely no issues there. And since I'm touching on the braking here, there is a performance pack actually available for the Mustang EcoBoost. That adds $2,500, which is honestly a steal when it comes to the EcoBoost because with the GT, that adds $4,000 for the performance pack. So really a nice deal when it comes to the EcoBoost. But nonetheless, that is gonna bump up the brake set up to 14 inch front rotors with four piston front calipers, 13 inch rear rotors with single piston calipers in the back there. So although this regular setup does stop quite nicely, that performance pack is going to give you even more stopping power if you wanted it. And that option is going to add more than just the brakes, of course. It's also going to give you a Torsen limited slip rear axle, a black painted strut tower brace, heavy duty front springs, larger radiator. It's going to add a rear spoiler in the back, unique chassis tuning, and an upsized rear sway bar as well. Therefore, you can conclude that the handling is going to be bumped up when it comes to that performance pack as well. And since I mentioned it, when it comes to the standard setup as far as suspension and handling, you will get monotube shocks, rear cross axis suspension joints, it's also an independent rear suspension. And like I had previously alluded to when it comes to this steering feel, with that steering feel mode that I was previously telling you about, it is definitely a nice steering feel. If you wanted a looser steering feel, just put it in that comfort mode. If you wanted the heavier feel like I like, put it in the sport mode. And the steering feel does feel on point with this one. As far as ride quality goes, I have had absolutely no issues, but in the back of my mind, I'm kind of comparing it to my GT, which I have lowered and upsized the wheels. So I can tell you definitely a better ride quality than I currently have. And if you want an even better ride quality, there is a MagnaRide damping system that adds around $1,700. But essentially what that is gonna do is scan the road up to a thousand times per second at each damper, really giving you the best of both worlds. Not only that smoother ride, but also tightening up the suspension around heavy cornering on the back roads. And honestly, if I were to do my GT again, I probably would go that route. And then when it comes to visibility, I can see perfectly fine out the back. I've never had any issues with Mustang visibility. So you are good to go there but enough with the driving dynamics you guys let's check out the exterior of the new 2019 Ford Mustang EcoBoost and so to start let me first touch on the color options available for the 2019 Mustang EcoBoost new colors for the 2019 model year are going to include velocity blue and need for green which is the best color for 2019 which is why I got it on my own the deleted colors for the 2019 Mustang are going to include triple yellow lightning blue and royal crimson but so anyways taking a look up front you will find LED headlights with LED signature lighting coming standard on every single trim level. Also LED front park turn lights, again, every single trim level. And if you go with the premium though, that will come with the automatic feature up there as well. Meaning when it starts to get dark out, the lights will turn on automatically for you. So you don't have to worry about that. Then make your way to the side, you will find body colored power adjustable side mirrors with integrated blind spot mirrors for every single trim level. Premium trim is also gonna give you heated side mirrors with integrated turn signals as well. And hiding underneath those side side mirrors with the premium, you will also get pony projection lights where at night it's gonna project that Mustang logo onto the ground. Definitely a pretty cool feature there, but now let's zoom out a little bit, taking a look at the wheel setup. 17 inch aluminum alloys will come with the standard fastback. Premium is gonna give you 18 inch aluminum alloy wheels. Performance pack is gonna bump that up once again to 19 by nine inch aluminum alloy wheels. And there are other options available. For instance, on the EcoBoost I have today, it does have the upgraded wheel and stripe package. You guys have probably already already noticed and that adds around $900 if you were interested but like I said there are a couple other options available as well but now making your way to the back on the EcoBoost you will find a rear spoiler if you go with the premium trim level again there is a larger rear spoiler if you go with the performance pack setup just below that LED sequential taillights will come standard on every single trim level sequential meaning when you put the turn signals on it's going to look like it's sliding from one side to the other and the Mustangs had this feature for quite a while but it's definitely unique to the Mustang and a nice little feature back Back there but just below all of that you will find dual exhaust outlets with chrome tips so you guys know what we have to do next as always here is that exhaust clip And 
let's open now since we are around back to open that rear trunk you do have two options you can either press the button on the key fob there twice or just up top of the license plate there there's a small little black button if you press that that's going to unlock the trunk as well but either way once opened up cargo capacity is going to come in at 13.5 cubic feet for the fastback 11.4 cubic feet if you go with a convertible either way if that was not in the space for you those rear seats do fold down it is a 50 50 split providing a little extra room if you needed it there then make your way up to the rear leg room that is going to come in at an even 29 inches so for reference i'm an even six feet tall it is basically unusable for adults back there better left to car seats or small children then make your way to the front seats there are manually adjustable cloth seats that will come standard premium trim is going to give you power adjustable leather seats and they will actually be heated and ventilated as well and i did want to also mention there are recaro bucket seats available plus side to them is you are going to get enhanced bolstering so if you take turns a little faster than the average driver they are going to be beneficial there however they are not heated or ventilated so that's really the trade-off with those but looking forward there is a tilt and telescoping steering wheel it is leather wrapped for every single trim level and a fun little fact for you guys here 2019 mustang gt comes with a smooth leather the 2019 mustang ecoboost comes with a texturized leather just like the mustang gt did from the years 2015 to 2017 so probably a useless fact to most but i wanted to mention it there also there is a heated steering wheel available with a 208 package that adds around $2,200 there but when it comes to the startup let me first start by showing you guys the key here you do have your Mustang logo on the one side as opposed to the Ford logo that's nice when you flip it over lock unlock the button to pop the rear trunk and that times two button in the middle there that is a remote start which believe it or not comes standard on every single trim level of the Mustang EcoBoost so definitely nice there as well once started up tachometer is going to be on your left speedometer is on your right there is a small digital display front and center if you wanted to adjust what is on that digital display there are steering wheel mounted controls on the right side of the steering wheel to do that but you can check out your trip information of course there's a digital speedometer available up there if you wanted it but perhaps my favorite part about this digital speedometer setup up here is the section labeled track apps which comes standard on every single mustang ecoboost but here is where you're going to be able to record your g-force statistics there's zero to 60 time quarter mile time there's brake performance you can also access that line lock feature i was telling you guys about but i have played around with this plenty of times in my own mustang gts see how quickly i can get to 60 it is definitely a quite fun feature worth trying out but so then the next question about the gauges somebody is going to ask is the 12 inch lcd digital gauge setup that one is going to come with a 201a package which is available with the premium trim only so if you wanted that full digital setup up there that is how you were going to get it. But then taking a look at overall interior quality, one of my favorite parts about the Mustang interior is the Mustang Insignia, just above the passenger side glove box there. I always like that. Dual zone climate control is gonna come with the premium trim levels. Premium trim is also gonna give you aluminum foot pedals, a universal garage door opener, chrome door speaker surrounds, and ambient lighting as well. That's definitely one I love playing around on my own Mustang. It makes it like a different car when you change up the colors at night. And another thing people always ask me about is there is no moonroof or sunroof available on the mustang basically because of the shape i believe anyways making our way to the tech setup on this one sync system is going to come standard on the mustang fastback however the sync 3 system which is the larger touchscreen display that is going to come with the premium or the 101a package which is what this base fastback has today but the 101a package by the way goes for an additional two thousand dollars but with either setup you're going to get bluetooth and audio streaming however sync 3 is going to give you android auto and apple carplay meaning if you have a smartphone simply hook it up to the Mustang and you can check out a free navigation system that you have up on that screen as well as the ability to like and dislike your Pandora songs up there as well. If you went up in the Appalachian Mountains here in PA and you lost cell phone service there is a factory navigation system available for an additional $800 there. You can also check out your climate control settings on the Sync 3 system up here as well and of course your radio information and by the way when it comes to the sound system on this one six speakers are going to come standard across the Mustang EcoBoost however if you go with the premium or the 101A package that we have today you will get a nine speaker sound system so you guys know what we have to do next let's turn on the radio see what we got playing today and let's test out the clarity of this one 
All right, you guys, definitely a nice sound. This is actually the same one I got my Mustang GT, so I can vouch for it. It is definitely nice. Plenty of bass, plenty of clarity, so I have no issues with that nine speaker sound system. But then last thing on the tech display I wanted to mention is when you do put the Mustang in reverse for every single trim level, you will get a rear view camera letting you know who or what is behind you, which is always is going to lead me into safety. And so to start, there are front side and side curtain airbags, but also driver and passenger knee airbags as well. In the back, there is latch, AKA lower anchors and tethers for children for the rear car seats. Also a tire pressure monitoring system will come standard. And there is a safety package option as well called the safe and smart package that has an additional $1,000, but that is gonna give you adaptive cruise control, automatic high beam control, lane keep alert, pre-collision assist with pedestrian detection and rain sensing windshield wipers as well, which I gotta say, that rain sensing windshield wipers is a pretty cool feature. I've driven plenty of cars with that and it is nice not having to touch the windshield wiper button all the time because the car detects it for you but anyways with the 201a package for the premium trim that one will also give you blind spot information system with rear cross traffic alert and so but anyways that is about it for this one you guys thank you so much for watching be sure to like the video and subscribe All right guys, Tedward here for Winding Road Magazine. Today we have two very special turbo cars. We're gonna start with this 911 Targa 4 GTS. Then we're gonna move on to the 600 LT. Of course this has basically the coolest mechanism in the business. We're gonna start out with that and then we're just gonna go for a nice drive.
Hello everyone, today in this video we are going to show you the top 10 most expensive production cars in the world. Notice that only cars which are still in production are included in the list. One-off special cars and cars sold in auction are not included in this list. Let's get started. Number 10. SSC Tuatara Estimated price 1.5 to 1.8 million US dollars. The SSC Tuatara is an American sports car produced by automobile manufacturer SSC North America. Production of the car began in 2019. SSC Tuatara has claimed top speed of 483 km per hour or 300 miles per hour. Production of the car will be limited to 100. Number 9. The Fenrir Supersport Price 1.6 million US dollars. The Fenner Supersport is a Lebanese limited production sports car built by W Motors, a United Arab Emirates based company. The manufacturer claims a top speed of 394 km per hour or 245 miles per hour. The Fenner Supersport is the successor of the famous Lycan Hypersport. Number 8. Hennessy Venom F5 Price 1.7 million US dollars. The Hennessy Venom F5 is an American high-performance sports car with a claimed top speed of 484 km an hour, or 301 miles per hour. With the Venom F5, Hennessy intends to set a new benchmark in the world of high-performance cars. Hennessy planned to produce only 24 units of Venom F5. Number 7. Zenvo TS1 GT Price 1.9 million US dollars the Zenvo TS1 GT is a Danish limited production sports car manufactured by automobile manufacturer Zenvo. Production of TS1 GT began in the year 2016. Zenvo claims an electronically limited top speed of 375 km per hour or 233 miles per hour. Number 6. Koenigsegg Regera. Price 2.1 million US dollars. The Koenigsegg Regera is a limited production plug-in hybrid grand touring sports car manufactured by Swedish automotive manufacturer Koenigsegg. The Regera has a claimed electronically limited top speed of 410 km per hour or 255 miles per hour. Koenigsegg only plans to produce 80 units of the car. Number 5. Koenigsegg Jesko. Price 3 million US dollars. The Koenigsegg Jesko is a Swedish limited production mid-engine sports car produced by automobile manufacturer Koenigsegg. The name Jesko is a tribute to the company founder's father, Jesko von Koenigsegg. Production of the Jesko will be limited to 125 units. The car has a claimed top speed of 483 km per hour or 300 miles per hour. Number 4. Aston Martin Valkyrie Price 3.2 million US dollars the Aston Martin Valkyrie is a limited production hybrid sports car collaboratively built by British automobile manufacturer Aston Martin, Red Bull Racing, and several other manufacturers. Aston Martin Valkyrie is a track-oriented car entirely usable and enjoyable as a road car. The car's makers claim the title of fastest street legal car in the world. The car's production is limited to 150 units only. The Aston Martin Valkyrie claims a top speed of 402 km per hour or 250 miles per hour. Number 3. Bugatti Chiron Sport Price 3.4 million US dollars The Bugatti Chiron Sport is a French mid-engine two-seater sports car developed by automobile manufacturer Bugatti Automobiles. The Chiron's top speed is electronically limited to 420 km per hour or 261 miles per hour for safety reasons mainly arising from the tires. Number 2. Pagani Waira Roadster BC Price 3.5 million US dollars The Pagani Waira Roadster BC is an Italian mid-engine sports car produced by sports car manufacturer Pagani. The Waira has a top speed of about 383 km per hour or 238 miles per hour. Production of the Waira Roadster BC will be limited to 40 units only. Number 1. Lamborghini Sion FKP37 Price 3.6 million US dollars The Lamborghini Sion FKP37 is an Italian mid-engine hybrid sports car produced by the automobile manufacturer Lamborghini. Unveiled online on 3rd September 2019, the Sion is the first hybrid production vehicle produced by Lamborghini. 
The car attains an electronically limited top speed of 350 km per hour or 217 miles per hour. Production of the Sayan FKP37 will be limited to 63 units.